Oh, are you able to see my first slide, my title slide? Yes? Yes, no, we can. Yes, okay, fine. So uh, thank you again for your kind invitation. This is my disclosure uh, slide. And uh, I will start saying that uh, ascites is the most common complication of compensated cirrhosis. And alone or combined with all the complication, it marks decompensation in almost 75% of cases. The compensation of cirrhosis leads to an abrupt and uh, substantial worsening of patient survival. If we compare the survival curve of the compensated cirrhosis to that of liver transplantation, there is no doubt that ascites apparent should prompt a patient referral to a transplant center for assessment. Indeed, we should not disregard that the MELT school can underestimate the death risk of patients with societies, a pitfall only partially corrected by the MELD sodium score. Can societies be prevented? The, the, the answer is yes. Uh, for example, successful etiological therapy or of HBV on your left or ACV related compensated cirrhosis on your right almost efface the occurrence of decompensation. The incidence rate of ascites can also be reduced by mechanistic approaches, which entail the knowledge of the pathophysiological background of ascites. Effective hypovolemia, secondary to peripheral, mainly splanchnic arterial vasodilation, leads to renal sodium and water retention. Due to sinusoidal portal hypertension, the consequent total plasma volume expansion enhances hepatic lymph formation that is drained by the thoracic duct. Once the thoracic duct scope is overwhelmed, hepatic lymph pours into the abdominal cavity through the glissonian membrane. Thus, Portal hypertension and renal sodium retention are two main targets of pathophysiological treatments. Indeed, propanolol or carvedilol administration to, patient, to patients with compensated cirrhosis and clinically significant portal hypertension reduces the cumulative incidence of the compensation, mainly lowering the incidence of ascites. This study ended prematurely due to a low enrollment rate. However, with about one third of the planned sample size, a clear trend to a reduced incidence of ascites in patients receiving potassium can renovate for 52 weeks emerge. I'm not claiming that we should give anti-mineral or corticoid drugs to our patient with compensated cirrhosis. However, I think that this matter would merit further investigation. Coming to the management of ascites, I will start by saying that the fundamentals of ascites treatment have been established for more than a decade ago. Therefore, I will deal very briefly with those topics that are now well established and more extensively with those that are more recent or under development. I would ideally stratify the natural history of cirrhosis into three stages. First appearance, difficult to treat, and refractory ascites. The risk of spontaneous bacteria peritonitis increases throughout these steps. The therapy of ascites at the first appearance aims at establishing a negative fluid balance accomplished by controlled sodium intake and diuretic administration. Many years ago, 
we showed that a mild reduction of dietary sodium does not improve the efficacy of a sequential diuretic treatment compared with a diet providing 120 millimoles of sodium per day, which is more or less the sodium content of a Mediterranean diet. It took several years before guidelines accepted this concept, but almost all of them now give this indication. Indeed, drastic reduction of sodium from the diet increased the risk of hyponatremia and renal failure. And more recently, it has also been shown that a strict adherence to a low sodium diet is associated with a poor calorie intake, which could enhance the malnutrition of patients with advanced cirrhosis. A few days, a few words, excuse me, about diuretics. Whether it is sequential, that is starting with anti-mineralocorticoids, followed by loop diuretics in case of insufficient response, or combining these drugs at once is preferable, seems to be dictated by patient features. Sequential treatment can be preferred in those with recent onset societies and well-preserved renal function, as it needs fewer adjustment of diuretic dosages in the follow-up. Combined treatment seems more appropriate in those with long-standing ascites and reduced glomerular filtration rate, as it ensures a more rapid resolution of ascites and lower incidence of side effects, mainly represented by hyperkalemia. In patients with more difficult to treat ascites, often associated with hyponatremia and renal impairment, inducing a negative fluid balance still represents a relevant goal. However, large volume paracentesis is indicated in patients presenting grade three ascites. Moreover, long-term albumin administration is a new most interesting option. The superiority of albumin compared with artificial plasma expanders in preventing paracentesis-induced circulatory dysfunction when five or more liters of ascites are removed has long been established. A more recent meta-analysis confirmed the superiority of albumin compared with plasma expander and vasoconstriction not only in preventing paracentesis-induced circulatory dysfunction, but also its clinical manifestations, such as hyponatremia and mortality. Still, we have an unresolved issue as far as the prevention of paracentesis-induced circulatory dysfunction is concerned, the amount of albumin to be used after low-volume paracentesis, alternatives to albumin after low volume paracentesis, the efficacy or low dose albumin after large volume paracentesis. The ANSA study is a non-profit, multi-center, randomized, pragmatic clinical trial that evaluated the effects on long-term administration of albumin to patients with cirrhosis and persistent non-complicated societies. We enroll patients with cirrhosis and persisting non-complicated ascites requiring the administration of at least 200 milligrams of anti-mineralocorticoids and 25 milligrams of frosemide per day. After stratification, according to the need of paracentesis in the month preceding the study, and a serum sodium concentration, patients were randomized one to one, to either standard medical treatment, which included albumin administration for well-established indications, or standard medical treatment plus 40 gram of albumin twice a week for the initial two weeks, and then 40 gram per week. The intention to treat population consisted of 218 patients in the albumin arm and 213 in the standard medical treatment arm. 
The follow-up lasted 18 months, or liver transplantation, tips in tertium, or to the severity of ascites refractoriness, requiring three or more paracentesis per month, which represents an indication to tips. Up to two thirds of patients in the standard medical treatment arm needed at least one paracentesis during their follow-up. Such a percentage was significantly reduced by 38 to 38% in the albumina. The cumulative incidence rate of paracentesis with standard medical treatment was 3.5 per patient per year and dropped by 54% with albumin. In addition to easing the management of ascites, the incidence of refractory ascites was also significantly reduced. In this slide, the cumulative incidence of complication of cirrhosis, such as spontaneous bacteria peritonitis, known as BP bacterial infections, episode of renal dysfunction, hepatorenal syndrome type 1, and severe hepatic encephalopathy were significantly lower in the patient who received albumin, as well as potential diuretic-induced side effects, such as hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. Gastrointestinal bleedings due to port hypertension didn't significantly differ between the two arms of the study. These results can explain how these patients underwent fewer hospitalization and more important, had a better survival with a 38% reduction of the hazard ratio for mortality. Mainly, but not exclusively due to the reduction of hospitalization, the incremental cost effectiveness per quality ratio or long-term albumin administration was well below the threshold adopted by the UK National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence to consider a treatment cost effective. Furthermore, the bootstrap analysis of the ANSWER study showed that long-term albumin administration was cost effective in 92.5% of cases and even cheaper than standard medical treatment in more than half of cases. The midodrine albumin in cirrhotic patients awaiting liver transplantation, the MACT study, challenged these results. This placebo-controlled clinical trial randomized patients listed for liver transplantation to receive 40 grams of albumin every 15 days, plus midodrine, from 15 to 30 milligram per day, according to the pressure response or placebos. In this study, no differences were seen in the probability of developing complications, which was the primary endpoint of the study, and in survival. The comparison between these studies provides some relevant information. They differ in terms of sample size, design, and baseline severity of cirrhosis. Far more important, in my opinion, is the longer median duration of albumin treatment. In the ANSWER study, exceeded one year, while it was about two months in the MAC trial due to a high rate of liver transplantation. Furthermore, the amount of albumin given in the MAC trial was about half of the amount given in the ANSWER study, which also used a loading dose. I think that this accounted for the fact that no changes in serum albumin were seen in the MAC study, while serum albumin in the ANSWER study increased by 0 0.7, 0 0.8 gram per deciliter within a month, and remain steady thereafter. We evaluated the importance of serum albumin levels reached under treatment 
in a postdoc analysis of the answer study database. On treatment, serum albumin at month one was closely associated with survival at 18 months. And in this graph, uh, where the dot areas are proportional to the number of patients included, the survival benefit progressed even once the lower normal limit of serum albumin concentration, that is 3.5 gram per deciliter, was reached. Then we, we are using uh, long-term albumin in patients with grade two or three of uncomplicated ascites, not to treat the complication ascites in itself, but because grade two and three ascites identify a group of patients, albumin administration acts as disease modify agent by improving survival, reducing complication and hospitalization, and so on. How long the term albumin administration can achieve this result could be explained in the light of the current knowledge of the pathophysiological background of the compensated cirrhosis. The systemic spread of pathogen associated molecular patterns due to abnormal translocation from the gut and damage associated molecular pattern released by disease liver after recognition by specific receptors activates immune cells to produce pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines along with highly reactive oxygen and nitrogen species. This cascade of events contributes to the development of circulatory dysfunction and along with it, favors multi-organ dysfunction and failure. In this context, albumin administration, beside promoting plasma volume expansion, uh, due to the pleiotropic properties of albumin, other events occur, such as binding of offending molecules, modulation of immune responses, antioxidation, improved cardiac function, and restoration of endothelial integrity. In the last stage, repeated paracentesis represent the first line treatment. Let's discuss about the transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunting and all the potential approaches. Refractory ascites have very poor prognosis, therefore referral to an assessment for liver transplantation is even more relevant. The accepted definition of refractoriness is a scientist that cannot be mobilized or the early recurrence of which cannot be satisfactorily prevented by medical therapy. Recurrence of a scientist at least three times over a year despite adequate management identifies a different entity. And I am underlying this difference to interpret the effects of TIPS insertion. TIP efficacy in controlling ascites is undisputed, and its more frequent adverse event is hepatic encephalopathy. Whether TIPS improves survival is debated, and different meta analyses reported different results depending on the studies included. Indeed, those trials that enroll patients with both refractory and recurring ascites reported a survival advantage, while those that only enroll patients with refractory ascites failed to show any effect on survival. Moreover, we must consider that all these studies employed bare stents. To the best of my knowledge, this is up to now the sole prospective randomized study that assessed the effects of PTFE coated stents in patients with recurrent ascites, showing a clear survival advantage compared with repeated paracentesis. <laughs> 
Small diameter stents reduce the incidence of tips induced hepatic encephalopathy. This retrospective study in patients with refractory ascites showed that the probability of remaining free from this complication was similar with either 10 or 8 millimeters stents. However, the probability of remaining free from paracentesis was significantly lower in the small diameter stent. These results seem contradicted by this prospective randomized study that also enrolled patients with refractory ascites, but substantially lower MELT score. Indeed, the number of patients free from paracentesis did not differ between six and eight or 10 millimeters, while the smallest stent ensure a better protection from hepatic encephalopathy. This meta-analysis on individual data suggests that TIPS ensures a lower mortality than repeated paracentesis in patients with refractory or recurrent ascites for any male score threshold considered. Most centers don't candidate for TIPS patients with male score above 18, 20. In this respect, I would like to recall the North American practice-based recommendations for TIPS that indicates that an overall assessment rather than an absolute male cutoff value should guide patients' candidacy. And the same source indicates the following as the absolute contraindications. Severe congestive heart failure and valvular heart disease, moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension, uncontrolled systemic infection, refractory, and I would add frequently recurrent over hepatic encephalopathy, unrelieved biliary obstruction and lesion or tumors in the liver parenchyma precluding TIPS insertion. Due to these and other potential condition, many patients with advanced cirrhosis cannot be candidate for TIPS. Therefore, alternatives are needed. This prospective non-randomized clinical trial enrolled patients with cirrhosis and refractory ascites, receiving albumin and confirmed the co-result of the ANSA study. Patients included in the active arm of the trial received 20 grams of albumin twice a week for a maximal duration of 24 months. Patients who receive albumin have a significantly lower mortality. Moreover, they underwent fewer re-hospitalization due to complication of cirrhosis, hepatic encephalopathy, accumulation of ascites, bacterial infections, as well as a decline in the hepatorenal syndrome incidence, even though the difference was not statistically significant. The automated low flow pump system is an alternative approach. It consists of a subcutaneously implanted battery power pump that moves ascites from the peritoneal cavity to the urinary bladder. Pump function can be monitored and regulated by a computer. This prospective trial compared alpha pump to repeated paracentesis and alpha pump significantly reduced the need for paracentesis with no effect on six months survival. Adverse events, either cirrhosis or device related, occur in a high number of patients. Namely, 45% of patients experience device related adverse effects. A more recent study reported similar result. It also reported an improved patient quality of life. But once more, device-related adverse events occur in more than 40% of patients. Percutaneous thoracic duct stenting in two patients with refractory ascites has recently been reported 
stenting of the thoracic duct at the lymph venous junction lead to the disappearance of lymphatic collaterals and the resolution of duct tortuosity and irregularities. More relevant, stenting led to a better ascites control within a month, followed by resolution within six months. I think that dealing with the management of ascites, the issue of non-selective beta blocker use in patients with refractory ascites cannot be overlooked. The debate broke out when a retrospective study performed in the Hôpital Bourgeon showed that treatment with non-selective beta blocker was associated with a reduced survival and was an independent predictor of mortality in this setting. Since then, several studies enrolling patients with or without refractory ascites, most of them retrospective, yielded conflicting results. For example, Mandorfer and co-workers reported a reduced survival in patients with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, but an improved survival in the others. A meta-analysis suggested that non-selective beta blockers don't affect survival in patients with either treatable or untreatable ascites. As in many other contexts, we should not look for a clear-cut answer. Clinical judgment should guide us. Current recommendations suggest those reduction or withdrawal of beta blockers when arterial hypotension, aponatremia, or acute kidney injury occur. Moreover, high doses should be avoided in patients with difficult to treat ascites. Hepatorenal syndrome is an ominous complication of cirrhosis entailing a poor prognosis. The median survival of hepatorenal syndrome type 2 is six months and drops to less than two weeks in the hepatorenal syndrome type 1. The nomenclature of the hepatorenal syndrome has changed in recent years by applying the diagnostic criteria for acute kidney injury proposed by the Kidney Disease Improvement Global Outcomes Guidelines. The current criteria defining acute kidney injury in cirrhosis refer to an abrupt reduction in kidney function defined as a serum creatinine increase of 0.3 milligram per deciliter or more in 48 hours or 50% increase for more than a week. The extent of these abnormalities grazed the severity of AKI in three stages. Peculiar to cirrhosis is the stratification of grade one in two substages, A and B, based on serum creatinine below or equal to or above 1.5 milligram per deciliter. The International Ascites Club has proposed this diagnostic algorithm to guide the differential diagnosis of acute kidney injury in cirrhosis. If the initial stage is one, monitoring and removal of potential risk factors are indicated. With resolution, close follow-up is warranted as these patients are prone to develop again renal dysfunction. Persistence will require re-evaluation. Progression, as well as an initial grade three, two or three, would require diuretic withdrawal and plasma volume expansion, possibly with albumin, one gram per kilogram of body weight for two days. Response to volume expansion identify pre-renal AKI. Lack of response should require differential diagnosis between hepatorenal syndrome and other form of acute kidney injury, especially acute tubular necrosis. The diagnostic criteria for hepatorenal syndrome, AKI, also require the absence of shock, nor current or recent treatment with nephrotoxic drug, 
and the absence of parenchymal disease as indicated by proteinuria, microhematuria, abnormal urinary injury biomarkers if they are available, and an abnormal renal ultrasonography. The differential diagnosis between hepatorenal syndrome and acute tubular necrosis can be challenging, especially in the transition phase between the two types of acute kidney injury. Urine biomarkers of tubular injury can help, but do not entirely resolve our uncertainties. For example, there is a substantial overlap in urine and gall between acute tubular necrosis and depatorenal syndrome associated with bacterial infections. An interesting approach consists in the combined use of parameters, biomarkers of tubular damage, such as urine and gall and interleukin-18, glomerular damage, such as albuminuria, and tubular function as the filter and load of sodium. In this cohort of patients with end-stage liver disease and AKI, the diagnosis of acute tubular necrosis, hepatorenal syndrome, and prerenal azotemia was made by blinded retrospective adjudication. The likelihood of a correct diagnosis based on the number of biomarkers above the optimal, optimal uh, diagnostic cutoff was maximal at the ends of the spectrum. But once more, some degree of overlap occur in the intermediate steps. Our understanding of the pathophysiology of hepatorenal syndrome has also changed. The classical view is that this complication is due to effective hypovolemia, reduced renal perfusion, and activation of intrarenal vasoconstrictor systems. This concept is the background of the current medical treatment of hepatorenal syndrome. However, all the factors are into play. Cardiomyopathy cooperates in the development of effective hypovolemia. Moreover, as I alluded to in a previous slide, sustained systemic inflammation is likely responsible for renal functional and structural damage. At last, I would add direct tubular injury due to inflammation, persisting ischemia, and bile salts. The treatment of choice of hepatorenal syndrome type 1 consists with the combined administration of terripressin and albumin for two weeks. This treatment resolved the syndrome in 35 to 40 percent of patients and improved renal function in about 45 percent of cases. Meta-analysis has shown that, that there is a trend to improve survival in the short term. These data overall were confirmed by the most recent control trial comparing the effect of terripressin plus albumin versus placebo plus albumin in hepatorenal syndrome type 1. Notably, albumin administration was recommended but not mandatory. An advantage in the reversal of hepatorenal syndrome was seen considering tips placement or death occurring before the patient met the criteria for clinical success or failure as competing events. There was no effect on 90 day survival. Noteworthy, patient included in the active arm of the study experienced more serious adverse events, including respiratory failure, which may reflect volume overload and could have negatively influenced survival. I would make a couple of comments about the baseline patients featured in this trial. Mean serum creatinine was relatively elevated, suggesting some delay between the initiation of the syndrome and the start of treatment. Mean serum albumin values in the normal range, considering the severity 
of cirrhosis in these patients, suggest the administration of large amount of albumin in the days preceding the study, and this may have favored fluid overload. Continuous infusion of terlipressin seems preferable to boluses. In this controlled trial, the final response, either full or partial, didn't differ between the two treatments. However, the infusion group received a lower maximal dose of terlipressin that likely accounted for the lower incidence of side effects. Terlipressin plus albumin is superior to a regime combining midodrine, an alpha adrenergic agonist, octreotide, promoting splanking vasoconstriction, and albumin. Indeed, both full and partial responses were more frequent with terlipressin and albumin. Comparative studies have shown that noradrenaline plus albumin is as effective as a terlipressin in patient population, including either both one type, one uh, um, hepatorenal syndrome type one and hepatorenal syndrome type two, or hepatorenal syndrome type one alone. However, these studies were possibly underpowered to warrant equivalence between the two treatments. Early pressing plus albumin has also been employed in the long term in patients with early relapse of hepatorenal syndrome. This slide reports our experience with a young man with cirrhosis due to boot carry syndrome and thrombosis of the portal and inferior vena cava vein, vena cava. He first developed type 1 on top of type 2 hepatorenal syndrome because of sepsis. A second episode occur because of urinary tract infections. The hepatorenal syndrome was resolved, but occur again without any apparent precipitating factor. Since then, treatment was maintained for about eight months, during which several infectious episodes occur until the patient underwent a successful liver transplantation with normal serum creatinine. This is highly relevant. As transplanted patients with ongoing hepatorenal syndrome have a lower survival rate, stay longer in ICU and hospital, and more often need post and dialysis than those without the hepatorenal syndrome. In contrast, Transplanted patients after resolution of the hepatorenal syndrome don't differ from those transplanted without the syndrome in terms of development of post-transplant renal failure and survival. I will devote my final slide to hepatorenal syndrome type 2, whose feature and diagnostic criteria have never been precisely defined. And in my opinion, even the new definition don't enlighten in all the shadows. Now we call hepatorenal syndrome type 1 as HRS non-acute kidney injury. After fulfilling the diagnostic criteria for HRS AKI, we refer to HRS acute kidney disease when an estimated glomerular filtration rate between 60 milliliters per minute or an increase in serum creatinine lower than 50% persists for less than three months in the absence of structural causes. When the reduction of estimated glomerular filtration rate persists for three or more months, we refer to HRS chronic kidney disease. In the past, several studies show that terlipressin plus albumin resolve hepatorenal syndrome type 2 in most cases. However, they also showed that relapse was almost universal. And therefore, it seemed appropriate 
to limit vasoconstriction to patients with hepatorenal syndrome type 2 candidates for liver transplantation, while paracentesis was indicated for the others. This is the first study that enrolled patients with hepatorenal syndrome type 2 according to the new definition of HRS CKD. After TIPS placement, renal function assessed by serum creatinine and estimated glomerular filtration rate underwent an early improvement which persisted during the follow-up up to one year. Interestingly, this beneficial effect was seen in every chronic kidney disease stage and was associated with a substantial improvement in the control of ascites. In conclusion, I think that uh, I could claim that ascites and hepatorenal syndrome are among the most severe complications of cirrhosis, challenging physicians who care for patients with chronic liver disease. Their management is based on well-established treatments while others are currently under development. The improved knowledge of the pathophysiological underlying these complications opens novel perspective for patient management. This can be pursued through mechanistic approaches against newly identified targets and both remodulating current treatments and employing new strategies will help in improving patient care. Many thanks for your attention.